Hi everyone, my name is Çağrı Erdem and I will be presenting you our project in its paper on the help of myself and my colleagues. Welcome and thanks for coming or virtually being here. Today I will tell you about how we tackle some challenges surrounding the concepts and methods of developing a virtual musical instrument for playing in the air. But first of all, what is it anyway? You can show your appreciation to a heavy metal band by headbanging and mimicking the guitar playing while listening at home or seeing the band live in a concert. That's what's called an air performance, right? I believe, on the other hand, that this term and all those air instrument championships also connotate some kind of mockery, too, because is it often thought that no physical instrument, no music making? But what about Thurman then? For exactly 100 years now, you can make sound with it in the air. And nowadays, generating electromagnetic fields around antennas is just one way of playing in the air, considering that there are many, many options like motion capture and physiological sensing devices that allow the performer to use their body as part of the musical instrument. In this context, we can brief the group their previous work in two categories. On one end, there have been projects that aim to recreate the guitar virtually and often designs uh, designed towards being commercially available products targeting a wide audience. On the other, there have been several different projects that actually used the body as part of the instrument and that were mainly created as artistic pieces. In this project, our aim is not to recreate the action sound couplings of electroacoustic guitar performance directly, but rather let them inspire the mappings in a new air instrument. In other words, we want to leverage the constraints and thus the sustainability of already acquired skills in playing a traditional instrument and reuse or repurpose it in making new sounds in interactive music, uh, computer music context. To this end, one option among many is to use muscle sensing as the input in order to leverage the physical energy transfer during push and pulls experience while ex uh, interacting with the instrument. So our overarching question is, how can we model the relationship between action and sound in guitar playing using the muscle sensing as the input? So in this project, what, we'll, what we do briefly is to build a data set of bioelectric muscle signals and audio recordings of guitar players performing a set of basic sound producing actions, which are impulsive, sustained, and iterative. In order to build such a data set, we develop custom recording and processing software. Then we use this multi-model data set to train a long short-term memory network that can predict the audio energy futures of free improvisations on the guitar relying on a data set of three distinct motion types. Okay, but before going any further into details, let me briefly mention here few concepts and terminology that we will rely on. Music related by the motion is a continuous temporal phenomenon, whereas action can be described as the goal-oriented chunking of such continuous physical phenomena, what Godoy and Lim Lehmann refer to as cognitive theory. There are several types and categories of music related body motion, but in this context, I will primarily focus on what is called as sound producing action, which are responsible for note production. Sound producing actions then can be further divided into excitation actions, such as the right hand that excites the strings, and modification actions, such as the left hand modifying the pitch. The excitation can be further divided into three main categories according to gestural sonorous objects model, which are impulsive, fast attack, continuous energy transfer, sustained, gradual onset, continuous energy transfer, and iterative, series of discontinuous energy transfer. An actual performance does not rely on these three conceptual categories, of course, but we can still think of an entire performance as comprised of different combinations of just these distinct sound produced actions. What I mean is, consider, for instance, that you jump from one type of action to the other. Even though these would be completely different types of motion, as the goal points become temporally close, they merge into a newer, co-articulated temporal shape, as you can see in the figure. So starting from there, as I just previously started, we can only rely on a data set of such three fundamental action types, and then train a neural network to predict such co-articulated temporal shapes of an entire free improvisation. 
Okay, so to that aim, here is our research design. We conducted a series of experiments with 33 guitar, electric guitar players. In order to perform these experiments, we developed new tools for data acquisition, processing, and preparation, like further synchronization, and interpolation, and so on. Using these recordings, we built a multimodal data set of two kinds of EMG, one consumer grade, one medical grade, motion capture, video, and sound, consisting of the guitarist performing a set of basic sound producing actions in addition to pre improvisation. We then performed statistical analysis using the mocap and uh, medical grade EMG data, which is yet subject to another paper. For this project particularly, we relied on the recordings from the My Arm Band, which are consumer grade EMG sample, and the audio recordings to develop a preliminary machine learning model. In the experiments, all participants used the same performance setup like the guitar, the amp, the plectrum, and so on. And each participant was recorded individually. The recorded part of the experiment relied on four tasks. Each was played separately with soft and strong dynamics and two improvisation. All given tasks focused on the notes B3 and C4 on the D string played by index and middle finger. Each task was recorded as a fixed form track of duration 2 minutes and 16 seconds, along with a metronome click at 70 BPM where participants were instructed to play for four bars, rest for two bars, and repeat the same pattern for five more times. Tasks were prompted through a custom Maxim SP patch on a screen, which allowed a more comfortable and efficient experiment process. And in the end, after excluding the broken data of two participants, we could build our data set with a total of 310 tasks, including improvisations from 31 participants. Here you can see how those three distinct motion types reflect on the raw EMG signals and the results in audio waveform plotted together. And here is a table that demonstrates the relationships between the bodily input and the sound output. Note that for now, we only focus on two of these, the raw EMG signals and the root mean square RMS feature of the resultant sound. Okay, so considering that one myo armband has eight EMG electrodes, and that we use the EMG signals from both arms. A 16-dimensional array of raw EMG signals was fed, was fed into the neural network at every 50 samples, which is equivalent to 250 milliseconds considering the myo armband's 200 hertz sampling rate. And then it was below the constraint of 300 millisecond acceptable delay that is suggested in the literature for myoelectric prosthetics. Here we use a relatively small element, which consists of five hidden layers and 32 elastium units in each layer. So what we do is we draw a fit to sample batch of training samples, use ReLU together with a hyperbolic tangent function in the output layer, calculate the training loss, where X RMS are the recorded values and X hat RMS are the values to be predicted, and N denotes the sliding window, which is 50, regarding the myo armband sampling rate that I just mentioned. And finally, we use the Adam optimizer with a fairly small learning rate. So typically, at the first five epochs, the loss drop quickly and becomes stable after ten epoch, which take around three hours. So overall, we could manage to finalize the entire training within the 12 hour limit of Google Colab. And in the result, as you can see, the model is generally capable of predicting the sound RMS. We were positively surprised to see that the model could predict the general trend of the sound energy in an entire free improvisation task, relying solely on these, uh, on the data set of these single tasks. And this is how the model predicts the RMS of tasks actually played in the air. There is one problem, though. Here you can see a, a kind of bass noise in the prediction, which shows a big influence of the raw EMG signal pattern, which we have to look into more, uh, more in the future work. So to wrap up, here is a simplified diagram that demonstrates our workflow and the main environments we use. We first developed an updated version of our Python-based Mayo 2 OS bridge, which implements low latency support for multiple Mayo armbands connected via, via individual Bluetooth low energy adapters. Then we developed another interface using PyAudio to record synchronized audio and sensor data. 
when it comes to processing, we first uh, made the alignment and interpolation of our data, uh, for which we mainly relied on SciPy. And then, while we used the raw EMG as the input, we extracted the RMS feature of the audio using Librosa library. And then, we built our long short term memory a recurrent neural network model in PyTorch. Finally, we tested the model using the audio programming software XMSP, where the sonification patch is built around a simple car plus strong algorithm programmed in the GAN environment within Max, where the RMS value is mapped to the decay and bumping parameters of the physical model. Briefly, this fairly simple synthesis method effectively shapes the white noise to simulate a guitar-like plucked string sound. Um, I, we should also note that the onsets are extracted from the predicted values within the Python script uh, and stored in the CSV file along with the RMS values and then sent into Max. So in the video, you can easily notice that when playing a series of fast attacks during the iterative task, onsets of the air instrument often lose the action sound synchrony. It's important because it reveals an important weakness of, this, of our strategy. As such, it motivated us towards modeling the entire spectrum of the recorded audio in the future work for better onset detection. So now, let's see the, that demo video. Finally, the main contributions of this project are we developed a custom software for interfacing the MyArm bands, recording and processing the data. Then we built a new multimodal data set that will also be publicly available. Furthermore, all of these have also been and can further be used as a framework for motion sound analysis. And in the future work, we will work on improving the model by adding more features in the input and output, such as the IME features from the sensor data and spectral features of the audio. We will then explore more that base noise that is biased towards the raw EMG signal pattern. We will develop a new framework that will run in real time and can be used to control a variety of sound synthesis methods. And what will ultimately follow is to conduct a thorough user study using this model-based control structure. Thank you for attention and being here. Hi guys, my name is Yu Dong Zhao, currently a third year PhD student studying in Center for Digital Music. 
Kimmery University of London. I'm very happy to be here to present my work to all of you. The title of my work is Identifying Master Violinists Using Note-Level Audio Features. The co-author is George Fazekas and Mark Sandler. The content of this paper is as follows. So, first of all, let's do the introduction of this paper. As we all know, the musical performance usually defined by three parts of people, including composers, performers, and listeners. The music structure, including pitch and rhythm, usually written by composers. And this expression is always given by performers, including their individual playing styles, their playing techniques, and their understanding of music. So the performances can be very different while different performers play the same piece of music. In this paper, we focus on the performers' individual playing styles and the identification of the performers. So we we'll listen to the same piece of music played by different performers, but their vibrato, their timing, and their energy is different. So let's, let's listen to the first music piece. It's warm and peace, right? Let's hear the second one. The vibrato is more faster compared to the first one, so it gives us the different feeling. Let's listen to the second example. The second performer. It's different, right? So aim to the energy. The second one. So it's easy to find that different performer gives different feelings to audience. So we, let's see some previous performer identification methods. So first one is melody contour or based on the frequency distribution. But the disadvantage of this work is depends on the instrument itself. The second method is beat level, tempo, or beat level loudness. It also ignores the impact of the beat itself. You know, the beat can vary from pieces to pieces. The third one is the proportion of vibrato in one music piece, but they ignore the detailed vibrato features. So the last is the energy contour. So the feature is quite simple and hard for multiple classification. The main contribution of this work is as follows. First one, we construct a novel dataset, then present a violinist identification method based on note level by bottle feature. Also, we present another violinist identification method based on note level onset feature. Finally, we identify master violinists using fusion features. Okay, let's see the methodology. We will present this, this part in these four aspects. Dataset construction, two kinds of feature extractions, classification method, and result and evaluation. So this is a flow chart of this presentation. The dataset is from concerto recordings. Aimed to the vibrato feature extraction method, we firstly do the solo vibrato note segmentation 
then do data pre-processing, then is a Vibrato features extraction, then we go through a Vibrato filter to get the feature distribution. For the onsets feature extraction method, we also, the data set is from Concerto recordings, but the first pre-processing uh, method is do the music piece segmentation, then is the selection of music piece, and then is onset time annotation, and finally is onset feature calculation. After that, we get the feature distribution as well. After we get the feature distribution, then analyze the similarity, then get the performer identif identification result. So let's see the Vibarto node dataset construction. First of all, we find nine leading master players, including Haifitz, Auslacher, Parman, Zuckman, Manuin, Stern, Accardo, Mutter, and Wengelhoff. Then we find five violin concertos. All of them, they have played it before. So let's see how we annotate the Vibarto note. So we just uh, give a music piece. We just manually annotate the onset of offset of one solo vibrato note. Then we get the segmentation of the solo vibrato note from the original recordings. So let's see. This is the note segmentation. There's the second one, the third one, fourth one, and fifth one. So from all the concertos, we annotate 162 vibrato notes from one performer's performance in total. So let's see the note onset dataset construction. This is also the waveform of a very short of music piece. We just annotate the onset of each note like this. This table shows how many onsets annotations from each concertos. So let's see the second part is the data pre-processing. After we get the Vibarto node segmentation, we need to do the extraction of fundamental frequency because all of the Vibarto features are extracted from fundamental frequency. After that, we do the signal smooth via a zero phase filter. Let's see why we need to do that. So this is a Vibrato node segmentation in waveform. Then by using the PIN, we get the fundamental frequency estimation curve. To avoid of the influence of the noise in the boundaries, we use a zero phase filter to smooth the signal. After the filter, let's see, the signal is much better. So let's see the future extraction part. There are four kinds of vibrato features, including note level, average vibrato extent, note level, average vibrato rate, and standard deviation of vibrato extent and vibrato rate. Let's see how we extract this. We list a Vibrato Extent feature extraction process in flowchart. As we introduced before, the F0 signal, just like this. Then we do the pick-picking of this, of this signal. Then we flip the signal over X axis. We do the pick-picking again. So we can easily get the every peak and trough in this signal, as the red dot shows. But there are still some fluctuations happened in the boundaries which are not caused by the vibrato. So according to the musicology paper and previous musicology series, we, we do the filter again to delete some points. So we get the every peak and trough caused by the vibrato in this case. So this is another part of the feature extraction. 
So in the onset feature, we extract only one feature named the node onset time deviation. In the top of this picture, it's a score of one music piece. Let's see also in the following bars in different color means the, the, perfor the performance from different performers, from performer 1 to performer 9. First of all, we align the start time of this music piece to the zero second. But from the second note, we can see the answer time is different from different performers. The dashed red line is the reference of the each note onset, onset time, which is calculated by the means of the onset time from the every performer's onset time. So then we can calculate the node deviation. After we extract the audio features, we can calculate their distribution by using the three models, including histogram, kernel density estimation, and Gaussian mixture model. So this is the vibrato extent from the two performers, for example. So this uh, blue histogram is from the high fades, and the pink one is from motor. Range of the vibrato using by high fades is more narrow than the motors. We use the feature distribution to describe the difference of different performers. Then we do the classification based on the single feature. As we mentioned before, there are 162 vibrato nodes annotated from each performer's performance. We do the eightfold leave one group out cross validation. Aim to the data distribution, we calculate the KL divergence between each training set and test set. So aim to the fusion feature classification, which means we use uh, different features together. We calculate the overall KL divergence by adding the every single KL divergence value together and give them the same weight. So in this paper, the omega n is 1. So which means we give an equal weight for each feature's KL divergence result. Let's see the results. So we use AE to denote the average vibrato extent, AR denote average vibrato rate, and so on. First of all, let's compare the result based on different distribution models. So it's easy to find that the histogram performs good in the vibrato features, whereas in the onset time deviation feature, the KDE performs better. So then we do the comparison of the results based on different vibrato features. So this is the F score result aimed to different vibrato features and the vibrato feature combination. We also can find that the uh, VC performs best among all of them. So let's give a confusion matrix of the combined vibrato features classification result. So this is the timing deviation classification result, which is much better than using vibrato features. So there are five audio features in total and we fuse them in different ways. So let's see how they perform. So we can find that the 3FF performs best. So let's see the confusion matrix. If we remember correctly, in the last confusion matrix by using the onset time deviation, the Manuin and Oscillacher confused with each other. But in this confusion matrix, we can distinguish them very clearly. Those F measure result is not as good as using the onset time deviation only, but the discrimination for each performer is better than using that single feature. So let's see the conclusion. First of all, timing features works better than vibrato features. Second, although the timing feature performs the best F measure result, the fusion features improve the discrimination for every performer. Third, 
Some feature works well for specific violinists, whereas the same feature is unhelpful for recognized other performers. Finally, the distribution methods don't strongly impact the classification result, but histogram works better for vibrato features, whereas KDE performs better for onset feature. In the future, first of all, we will enlarge the size of vibrato dataset. Then we will combine different vibrato features using different weight, not just average. The third, extract more timing features and other kind of feature like timbre, dynamic, and so on. Finally, we will try other classification methods like decision trees or neural networks. This is the reference. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Luca Marinelli. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about our study on musical dynamics classification with convolutional neural networks and modulation spectra. Following a short introduction and discussion of relevant literature, we will move to discuss the main experiments performed with convolutional neural networks. Finally, a novel de scalar descriptor based on modulation power spectra will be presented and tested against a baseline from a previous study. As many of you already know, musical dynamics indicate instrument intensity levels denoted in musical scores by marks usually ranging from pianississimo to fortississimo. Listeners have been reported to be able to recognize dynamics even when no reliable loudness information is available. This implies that variation in the timbre space of musical instruments are a byproduct of different dynamics. In a study by Van Vainzier et al., which was performed on the same dataset used in this study, three descriptors of timbre were identified, which were able to explain 72% of dynamics variance in scenarios without loud loudness information, namely attack slope, spectral skewness, and spectral flatness. The modulation power spectrum is obtained through a two-dimensional Fourier transform of a spectrogram. In telecommunication, the term modulation refers to the process of multiplexing a signal that carries information, the carrier, with a signal that contains the message to be transmitted. Unfortunately, this definition implies specific constraints which do not apply to um, acoustic signals. So essentially, the modulation power spectrum of an acoustic signal is nothing but a mapping of the fluctuations of the signal that indicates how its energy changes over time and frequency. Anyway, this joint spectrotemporal representation was found to correlate with many timbre percepts, both in terms of sound identity and musical qualities. To explain the figure a little bit more into details, Downsweeps in frequency are mapped to pixel in the right quadrant, whereas uh, upward drifts in frequency appear in the left quadrant. Slower temporal changes are located near the zero of the axis, while faster changes result in higher temporal modulation towards the left and the right of the image. Even if quite abstract, the MPS is appealing because it offers an invertible representation of the spectrum that is invariant to translations in the time frequency domain. It is both psychoacoustically and physiologically motivated, as it correlates with timbre similarity ratings and it approximates the modulation transfer function of the auditory cortical networks. In addition, in two studies, it was successfully used for instrument recognition, as different instruments are mapped onto separated regions of the MPS. Let's now move to the main round of experiments from the present study. From an extensive dataset consisting of uh, single notes of all instruments of the Beethovenian orchestra, which were played on their entire range and at two dynamics, from each sample, we extracted one second, one second snippets and where their starting points uh, were the beginning of the sustained phase, as you can see in the corner, in the left corner. Then um, 
equivalent rectangular bandwidth scaled and mel scaled spectrograms were computed and normalized frame-wise by their respective uh, RMS. Then, from the mel spectrograms, we finally obtain the modulation power spectra. Finally, these three two-dimensional audio representations were then used to train the same convolutional neural network architecture. Given that no previous work on MTS or dynamics classification and CNNs was available, this architecture was selected through systematic trial and, trial and error. In the final proposed architecture, we have uh, three two-dimensional convolutional layers where, with the first uh, having 16 filters, a 7x7 seven seven kernel and a stride of 3. So a strided convolution. The second and the third with 32 and 64 filters respectively, with a 3x3 three three kernel and a stride of 1. And finally, a softmax classifier that receives its inputs from a dense layer with 128 neurons. We found uh, um, average pooling to reduce uh, overfitting and we used to regularize uh, a classic uh, dropout uh, with a um, dropout probability of 0 0.5. In order to test the robustness of the extracted features, the test sets in three experiments were partitioned in order to promote or avoid the selection bias. From the first to the third experiment, we will see how selection bias is gradually increased and which consequences it has on the results of the models. In this first experiment, a tenfold cross-validation was performed on the entire randomized dataset and the differences in the results were tested for significance with the Wilcoxon test. We see how the mass spectrograms perform slightly better than the other two audio representation. And also how essentially there is no significant difference in the performance of the model strain on ERB spectrograms and uh, MPS. In the second experiment to increase selection bias, Instruments from different timbre families are chosen to define five test sets. The instrument families are the following. We have clarinet for the single reeds, flute for the aerophones, oboe for the double reeds, trombone for brass, and violin for the bowed strings, or violin family. Here again, we see how um, time frequency representation score better results than modulation power spectrum. But um, clarification is um, due to the for, for the flute test sets because we have that um, all the aerophones contained in the data set are solely present in the test sets. And this can help to explain why all models obtain suboptimal results on the flute test set. In the third and last experiment performed with uh, convolutional neural networks, the four test sets consisted of all instruments from a specific timbre family. This means that, the, that similarly to the aerophones in the previous experiments, all samples in the dataset from each instrument family are contained in the respective test sets. In this case, we see how selection bias is strongly present as uh, the training sets are ensured to be non-representative uh, of the test sets. And here, surprisingly, we see how the MPS outperform the two time frequency representation on all test sets. In a first attempt to throw some light on what we just saw, uh, we thought to use saliency maps. The idea behind saliency maps is uh, pretty simple. In a nutshell, um, the gradient of the output is computed with respect to the input image. This, in return, tell us, tells us uh, how the output value changes with respect to small changes in the input. 
the average of uh, the maps relative uh, to all inputs for a specific class so for all inputs um, for pianissimo and fortissimo were computed for each family separately as an example here we can see the saliency maps computed on the pianissimo and fortissimo neurons average over all single read samples Saliency maps uh, can be interpreted also as uh, correlation maps, where a salient region basically represents an area of the input that highly correlates with the chosen target. By comparing the saliency maps of the pianissimo and fortissimo classes for each family, as we can see here, uh, they are proposed in pairs. Uh, in the left uh, we have the pianissimo and on the right we have the fortissimo uh, sal saliency maps. We can see that uh, a clear pattern appears. Um, for uh, all families in the pianissimo maps, you can see a central salient region, um, which is also sometimes present on the fortissimo maps for all families. In order to further investigate to what extent uh, this central area is alone effective in predicting the dynamics of single nodes, a scalar timbre descriptor is here defined as the average computed from 2 to 16 cycles per kilohertz of the sum of the temporal frames from 0 to 3 hertz of the MPS. We call this uh, scalar descriptor uh, steady spectral modulation. On the right, you can also see the distribution of the scalar descriptor on the entire dataset uh, for the two classes. In the final experiment, we tested our novel descriptor against the spectral features selected in the NCR study for the same task and for the same dataset. But given that in our study we analyzed only the sustained phase of single nodes, the attack slope was left out uh, from this comparison. This anyway should not raise too many concerns because the attack slope was found to be the least discriminative features and as it could explain only 8% of the total variance. Here uh, we see how on a 10-fold cross-validated linear discriminant analysis, the steady spectral modulation power was able to obtain a 44.8 error reduction. In conclusion, musical dynamics produce variations in the modulation space which are concentrated among low temporal modulations. What's more, the translation invariance afforded by modulation power spectra seems to produce features which are more robust against selection bias. In future studies, we propose to include different dynamics gradations between pianissimo and fortissimo, such as piano, mezzo piano forte and mezzo forte, and then to try uh, to train a regressor on the proposed scalar descriptor. In addition, this study showed that the translation invariance afforded by modulation power spectra enables the extraction of features that are more locally spaced in the input domain than those based on time frequency representation. This property of the MPS extracted features and the invertibility of the MPS combined with visualization tools for neural networks could facilitate the investigation of such features from a perceptual point of view. And that brings us to the end. And thank you so much for your interest and attention. And for those of you who have uh, any question, I'll see you soon at the video call.
Hello, everybody. So glad we could all join each other together. So I am Becky Stewart, and I am coming to you from a, a heat wave in London. And so I hope you're all doing well where you are. And so I think we first all want to give a, a virtual round of applause to all three authors and, and their presentations. And we uh, very much appreciated all of the, the excellent work we just heard from. So if you are just joining the session for the, the first time, the way this works is you will be putting in your questions into the YouTube chat. I will keep an eye out for those and then I will pass those along to each of our authors for them to address and to answer. So I will try to keep an eye on that uh, and do that. So let's go ahead and let's start with some questions in the order of the papers that we had them. So let's go back to our, our very first paper where we were looking at uh, some air guitar performance and um, how we could yeah. map between uh, a variety of uh, signal inputs into a sound output. And let's start with the question that everyone always wants to know. Your data set and your models, will those be available for other people to access and to use? Yes, definitely. Um, right now, the, the current version of the model is, is in GitHub, but now I'm working on kind of the improved version of the model. and. I hope to release both the new version of the model and the data set by the end of summer, but I need to double check the, the this ethical terms of, uh, you know, uh, when I can release the data set and everything, but hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so people can kind of keep an eye on that. Maybe later you might yeah. want to, you could add your GitHub name to the to the chat or something like that if people want sure. to just be able to, to follow you there. Sure. That could work. Excellent. Um, so on to a little bit more of the, the, the meat of what you were working on. What was the, uh, the balance of the input between the biometric signals that you were capturing from the Mayo versus the video, uh, that the mocap that you were using. And how, did, you, did you look at how each of those influenced the sound quality that was generated? Um, well, first of all, uh, I think I couldn't make it clear in the presentation, but in the model, uh, we didn't use mocap or video at all. Like it's only uh, EMG signals that is used uh, in, the, in the model. We use the, the rest of the, of the data and in, in, a more, in a more analytical study, uh, which is kind of subject to another paper, but, uh, but no, they're not in the model. So that's, the, that's one thing. And the second thing, I think I'm not, uh, I couldn't really understand the question of how it influences the, the sound quality. You mean the, the predicted uh, futures or that, is it the question? That, that was my interpretation of the question. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's I, pretty clear if if the video wasn't even used in the model, well, then it didn't influence it at all. <laughs> no, but 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 I have to say um, that the EMG signals, since we we use the raw uh, EMG signals, it influenced the the predicted futures heavily. Actually, you know, you can uh, I, I touched upon a little bit in the presentation, but you know the. Imagine this idiosyncratic uh, patterns of raw EMG or raw bioelectric signals, and you can see those patterns in the output. So this is, on one hand, this can be seen as the mistake or something wrong, but on the other hand, from a creative perspective, this can be even a kind of a positive thing. So it's, you know, it depends on how you want to use it, uh, I think. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, then there was uh, several questions kind of talking about the role of experts. So you had experts involved to create the data set. Did you have a chance yeah. to get any feedback from experts on the output model or if there's future plans to have experts kind of perform mm -hmm. using this model? No, that's the that's the, uh, the that, that's going to be in the in the uh, in the second phase of the work because uh, unfortunately we couldn't really um, conduct a thorough user study after we, we built the model. But uh, so the, uh, the question, uh, to address that question, we tested uh, the, the model only with one expert air, air guitar player, which is myself, actually. <laughs> but uh, but, but in the <laughs> I would call myself an expert. <laughs> player, but it, okay, so but 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 in the, in the second phase, like we what uh, we want to do is to call uh, most of those guitar players that uh, took part in the in the first study and then try out the, the system uh, so that we can kind of compare their 
the, you know, both in a quantitative and qualitative way. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Of course, great. Place, right? <laughs> And so, of course, you started with more kind of simplistic playing and kind of single notes because um, you got to start, got to start somewhere. Um, have, did you have you started to explore more complex, more musical playing and things like you know adding timbral effects from palm muting and, and, and these kinds of extra interactions? Okay, so I think um, so. There are uh, multiple questions in this <laughs> one question. Okay, first of all, um, we tested the model with the free improvisations uh, from those guitars. So now the model is able to predict the uh, the RMS of an entire free improvisation from the guitars, but we couldn't really test it, test it with, with air guitar performance because just using the RMS, you cannot really rely on, uh, on, the, on the onset detection based on RMS. So when you're playing in the air, you cannot really have a good note on sets. So this is why like we couldn't really test using like some complex playing in the air. So that's one thing. And coming to um, the, the the different playing techniques like palm muting. Well, first of all, I'm particularly interested in palm muting as an avid metal player. So a uh, uh, listener. Um, but um, and it's also a very interesting uh, style because on just one limb, you can combine both excitation and modification um, action. Actually, you know, you can you can excite the string and modify with your with your palm. It's it's, it's a completely different um, like it requires a completely different data set. First of all, so if in the future, if uh, anyone wants to collaborate to build that kind of data set, I would be super interested in in, in investigate that. <laughs> And lastly, about the, the timbral output, like now in the in the second uh, phase of the uh, of the project, now I'm working on predicting the entire spectrum instead of just one single future. So we will see how the input motion will contribute to the to the sound output. Right. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I think we should, in the interest of time, move on to the second paper then. And so we move on to Yunong's paper about vibrato and uh, violin uh, performance. And you addressed this a little bit in the chat, but maybe just to be able to kind of readdress this to everybody who might have missed that, there was again the question around data sets and the, the releasing of, of the data. Yeah. I think for data set part, because uh, copyright things, we cannot release an audio directly. But I think we can just release the annotation and maybe, for example, the onset and offset time in the uh, in the specific audio. And also, we can just release the version number of the CD recording. So if if the maybe other users can just get the CD recordings as same as what I have used, so they can use annotation directly. So I think it's a, it's a kind of method to release that data set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, things are always a little bit complicated, especially around copyright. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> An answer we all are familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, just want to just add a reminder if anyone wants to uh, add any questions for uh, for Luca to answer as well, or any other questions that you think of while we're having these discussions, please just add them to the to the chat, and I'll keep an eye on that. It's not too late to contribute questions. Um, but sorry, you don't. Uh, uh, there was a question over the kind of the analysis. Uh, if there was analysis over the kind of the evolution of the note as it was being played, and, and the, is what was uh, the change in vibrato over time. Um, was that being considered? Yeah, so I think for that part is uh, I think for the change of vibrato is still is also important by analyzing the individual playing styles of each performer. But the thing is also because the data set size, because it's hard for us to just uh, uh, label the like like several hundred of notes from from several concertos by uh, like labeling where the vibrato uh, happens. But if we just find a system knows maybe for system two seconds or more, like much longer, like much longer notes, I think it's harder to annotate maybe like 100 notes. I think is a little bit hard. But I think for the idea, it's really good. I can try to like do some model to just analyze the vibrato change, the individual vibrato change for mm -hmm. each performer. So then I can maybe try to find some 
like characteristics for each performer and maybe there will be some discoveries or or not but i'm not sure yeah yeah <laughs> and then there was some interest if you could talk a little bit more about the timing features that you did use and um for example you know kind of what normalization was used to to, to work with these and so on yeah, I should say sorry for I just ignored the part of the normalization in the presentation. Yes, exactly. I did the normalization things after I ex extract the timing onset deviations. Then I just use uh, maybe zero to one uh, normalization for each performer's onset uh, deviation result. So after that, I I just build the different models to uh, get the distribution of the timing onset features. So so then just did the similarity analysis and also do the identification things. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on then. Uh, we have a couple more minutes still. Still doing good on time. And move on to, to Luca in, in your paper. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Let, Let's just let's just round out with the same question to you as well. Um, for data set access and kind of open data, are there any plans in being able to release this this data set that you've been working on and the annotations that went with it? The data set is already open access. You can access it uh, through the link provided in the paper is in the deposit ones of the TU Berlin. And um, the annotation to everything is already there. Uh, <laughs> The, the code, uh, on the other hand, um, I have to be honest here, I, uh, this was my master thesis project, uh, so I have been doing it uh, really not professionally. Now I have been working as a developer, so I, have, I really have to clean it up <laughs> <laughs> before releasing it. <laughs> yes. But yes, yeah, no. anyone who is in, interested, uh, just email me. Um, there is the email on the paper, or uh, I will soon move uh, to London um, at the C4DM, so maybe also there you will be able to reach me. And uh, yeah, who is interested, I will, I will forward it per email, no problem. <laughs> Excellent, that's great to hear. It's great to hear open data being shared for other researchers to be able to build off of as well. And yes, I think everyone feels self-conscious about their own code <laughs> that they write for their research, certainly. <laughs> um, let me... I have a question, but let me make sure no one else had a question that I'm stepping over first now. Great. So you've looked at quite the extremes in the dynamic range uh, of the individual instruments. What do you think putting in a more kind of mezzo kind of uh, dynamic, somewhat more of a middle point or even multiple middle points between uh, the very quiet and the very loud, do you think that would uh, significantly change the, the work and the outcomes? Do you think it would be kind of a, I don't know, a, a, a kind of linear space between the two? Or do you expect that there'd be far more complicated things to introduce this extra kind of point of loudness? Um, regarding which kind of uh, um, kernel to use in the regressor, well, has to be still to be decided. We don't have the data yet, but I would imagine, given that uh, the, we have this uh, scalar descriptor that uh, showed a really strong separation, also intra instrument. I showed in the presentation only the distribution of, on the entire data set, but data was also um, the, the distribution was also analyzed per, in, per each um, instrument family, and. Uh, uh, I think it was really strong and uh, really clear between pianissimo and fortissimo, so I would imagine some kind of regressor could be totally built on that. Maybe linear, who, who knows, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes such simple things are elegantly yes. appropriate, and sometimes the world's not so simple. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Let me, I'll do one more glance at the chat to make sure there's no other last minute questions. I don't, which means we are perfectly within time, which is fantastic. Uh, and so we have the next session will be a poster session uh, that will be uh, sh uh, starting shortly. But I once again, thank all of the authors for their for their contributions and for their presentations. And we're sorry that we can't all be together, but uh, very glad that we are still be able to uh, learn from your work and, and have you share it with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much.